Hello everyone and welcome back to another in-depth review video here on the Fly From Home YouTube channel. And this uh, this time we've got this lovely looking Diamond DA426 by Cows. Interesting name. Um, so quick disclaimer before we start on this one. Usually I am 100% impartial with these reviews. Uh, I have no skin in the game. I've either been given it very kindly by a developer to review, or uh, I've bought it out of my own hard work, earned cash. This one's a little bit different because I've actually had a hand in helping to test and develop this. Uh, I've got no idea when it comes to software development, people far more intelligent than me did all of that stuff, but I was one of the, the testers who helped to refine uh, the flight model and the systems of this aircraft. I also provided some audio files and all sorts of different things for this project um, because, uh, as you may know, in real life for a, a very long time when I was a flying instructor, I flew this aircraft for multi-engine and instrument rating training with students in the United Kingdom. So, obviously, I, uh, I, <laughs> I want it to be good and I want all of you to think it's good. So, disclaimer, I'm not going to be maybe quite as impartial. I'm going to try my hardest to be as impartial as possible and to pick out as many things that I don't like about this. And there are a, free, a few things. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I do really want you, you guys to, to enjoy this and, and to like it and to think that I did a good job and that everybody who worked on this did a good job because the, the guys who worked on it worked incredibly hard behind the scenes to make this a really, really good aircraft. And I believe it is a really, really good aircraft. Spoiler alert. Um, but I'll try to, to do my best to be as impartial as possible. Anyway, um, as you may know by now with these review videos, they're quite long. Um, so there's going to be timestamps below in the description. Please refer to the timestamps if you are not on board for uh, best part of two hour video because that's how long it's going to be, I think. So that's that out of the way. Uh, the next thing is general um, format of the video. So we're going to have a look in the hangar at the different uh, liveries and the external model of the aircraft in here. We're then going to get into the simulator and we're going to do a controlled review flight in calm conditions with no fancy weather or anything like that. We're going to put the aircraft through some general handling and performance checks. Then we're going to fly some circuits, which is going to include some asymmetric drills. Um, and I'm going to provide as much of an insight as possible because I, I get that I'm not maybe quite as impartial, but maybe I can be a little bit more of a, of a tutorial type thing with this video. But anyway, we'll start off with how we always start off, which is a little bit of history about the real aircraft. So what is the DA-42? Well, it's a four-seat twin-engine propeller-driven aeroplane, of course, developed and manufactured by the Austrian-based company Diamond Aircraft Industries. It's the first twin-engine diamond aircraft, uh, as well as the first new European twin-engine aircraft in this category, developed over 25 years. The, the, the twin-engine light-twin market had gone very stale for a very long period of time, um, the light aircraft training market was kind of um, dominated by things like Seminoles and Duchesses, your typical sort of 1970s, 1960s even vintage light twin trainers. So for this thing to come along looking like, I don't know, like a Klingon warbird or something, um, completely made out of composite and all the rest of it, kind of blew the market away really. It's a, it's a big breath of fresh air. The DA-42 became the first diesel-powered fixed-wing aircraft to form a non-stop crossing of the North Atlantic. It's quite cool. Um, and the yeah, DA-42 is a key revenue generator for the company, having gained popularity with government and military operators in addition to the civil market that has uh, suffered as a result of the recession. Government customers uh, typically employ the type in the aerial surveillance role. Yep, you'll quite often find DA-42s with an extended nose module and a big camera fit under there, um, doing all sorts of air surveys and reconnaissance and all that kind of stuff. Uh, there is even a medium altitude long endurance um, unmanned aerial vehicle based on a DA-42. So you can either have a drone version if you really want. Um, so DA-42 received certification in 2004 um, from EASA, which is the European Safety Agency, Aviation Safety, Safety Agency, and then in 2005 from the FAA, which is the Federal Aviation Agency in the United States. It's certified to fly under both VFR and IFR, and operates in a wide range of con conditions. It's been observed that the DA-42 has no natural competitors in its class, and sets a benchmark for European general aviation, quote-unquote. So that's a little piece of uh, 
marketing gumpf, I think. So as I, m I mentioned, there was a non-stop crossing of the North Atlantic taking 12 and a half hours. Don't sign me up for that one. I'd rather not be spending 12 and a half hours in this airplane, as nice as it is. Um, <laughs> but still, uh, I like to have a toilet when I'm doing long flights. So various different versions of this of this aircraft came out. The original version was powered by a Thialert engine uh, called a Centurion. It's, um, I believe it's about 125 horsepower, 130 horsepower, uh, 1.7 litre engine. It's essentially the engine out of a Mercedes A-Class. So it's a four-cylinder inline water-cooled turbocharged compression ignition engine, diesel engine effectively. So very, very different to the horizontally opposed Avgas powered engines in the vast majority of piston twins. So straight away, there's a huge difference there from what you'd normally get in a twin engine training aircraft or twin engine light aircraft in general. Um, these engines were not the best in the world. They especially suffered from ECU issues. Um, back when I was first starting my flight training seriously, my commercial flight training back in about 2009, these things had a bit of a reputation for being kind of wet on performance and pretty unreliable so the, the 125 130 horsepower is not really i mean it's it's a light aircraft and it's a very efficient aircraft um but it had a reputation for being a little bit slow and cumbersome and in addition to the reli reliability issues uh it wasn't the most popular aircraft in the world but over time diamond worked on things the thylet engines were um, modified they were bored out to two liters uh, and derated to produce the same amount of horsepower as the old engines, but they did have uh, an increased amount of torque, I believe. So there was a little bit of a performance increase and also a massive uh, reliability increase as well. They sorted the problems with the ECUs. There's double redundancy on the ECUs. They've got their own power supply as well. Um, so all of the ECU failure issues where the engines were essentially going into limp mode and the aircraft was just kind of struggling around on half power. Um, pretty much went away overnight when that happened and, and all the aircraft have been retrofitted or, um, well, I say all, the vast majority, I would say, of, of the original DA-42s have been retrofitted with the two-litre engines. The flying school that I uh, work, well, worked for full-time, I still work for part-time, uh, we have a, quite a lot of older TDI uh, first-generation DA-42s, but they've all been upgraded to this, this two-litre uh, version of the engine. They've also been upgraded to a spec called CD155. Now that essentially takes away the artificial D rate from the 2 litre engine and allows it to produce 155 horsepower as the name suggests. And when you got a 155 horse out of an engine which is actually a little bit lighter than the newer engines, you get very very good performance. It's pretty much equivalent to the, to the new version which is what we've got here in front of us. But anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. Um, in March 2009, Diamond achieved DRC certification for the Ostro engine AE300, which is what we've got here. Um, I believe it's 169 horsepower for these engines. They're slightly heavier, though, than the CD155, so the performance is broadly similar, although you do get a bit more true airspeed at high altitude with these ones. I believe it uh, tazzes out about almost 200 knots um, up at the service ceiling of, I think, think 17,000 feet may have to correct myself with that one um, whereas the uh, the 155 is a, is a bit slow about 10 knots 20 knots slower something like that at, at high altitude but at sort of mid altitudes the performance is broadly similar um, the more modern version of the DA42 has improved aerodynamics so it's got a slightly more smooth cowlings which reduce drag um, it also has a slightly reprofiled canopy that gives more headroom to the people inside because the problem with the original DA42 uh, airframe was that it was quite restrictive in headroom for tall people and that's something that I've come across during my time instructing on, on one of these aircraft. A few of the students afflicted with the tall gene uh, had very very limited headroom. It's obviously fairly conventional in its layout, it's a T-tail, uh, it's got retractable tricycle landing gear but where it's a little bit different is that it's made entirely of composite materials um, carbon fiber reinforced polymers, CFRP, carbon fiber reinforced plastic throughout the aircraft. So there's no uh, aluminium or anything like that. There is, there's GRP glass reinforced plastic for the wingtips. Um, I believe the rudder is GRP as well, but the rest of it's all uh, carbon fiber, very lightweight uh, is of course the advantage to that. Um, the disadvantage is any damage which you could just 
bash out of an aluminium aeroplane. You can just knock dents out of it. Um, if you have a, d a dent in carbon fibre, it generally cracks and shatters the, the carbon, and a very, very expensive repair is the, uh, is the outcome of that. So on a training aircraft, which generally have quite a hard life, it can be a little bit of a downside at times. But the upside is, of course, it's a very smooth, lightweight airframe, very, very low drag, and that's the, the name of the game with this aircraft, really. Um, it's also incredibly strong, so the, the fuselage of this aircraft is um, all kind of stress-tested. It's all a stressed member uh, part of the aircraft. The, the seats are bonded in, they're fixed, so the rudders, pedals move backwards and forwards. The seats are fixed into the fuselage, into the floor of the fuselage. It's all one piece. Um, I mean, effectively what you have is the, the airframe is made out of um, different pieces with, with flexible joints. So they're quite long wings and they do flex a fair bit. Um, but there's a joint there that allows it to flex and all of this piece here, the stub wing um, and the fuselage, you can see the join runs underneath here so that the, the stub wing and, and all this is, is one piece and then the fuselage is all one piece here which helps to keep it very very strong um, there's some stories of, of some really quite nasty accidents which um, would have probably resulted in fatalities in any other type of aircraft, but in the DA-42, because of how strong it is, um, people managed to, to get out of that um, in one piece, not saying completely unharmed, but certainly not uh, not as bad as it would have been in a, in a traditional aircraft. So it's a huge advantage in terms of uh, safety. Um, principal flight controls in this aircraft, a little bit different to a traditional piston uh, twin, old-fashioned version. You usually have uh, cables, um, Bowden cables, I believe they're called, running around the wings and up to the elevator and all the rest of it. Um, you don't have that in the day 42 it's all torque tubes. So the controls are very, very fine and sensitive. They're actually quite light for an aircraft, which is reasonably large. Uh, it's certainly a lot larger than something like a PA-28, um, single-engine PA-28 uh, Arrow, for example. is a lot heavier on the controls and a lot less direct feeling than the DA-42, which is a much larger aircraft. So it does feel very, it's very nice and responsive to fly. It's a very, very pleasant aeroplane to fly um, by hand, although it does have a reasonably good autopilot. The rudder is, is traditional cables, um, but the, uh, the rest of it is all, uh, all torque tubes. The trims are cables as well. Uh, inside, you've got the Garmin G1000 glass cockpit, which is a very capable piece of avionics, which we'll see when we get the aircraft airborne. Uh, you have the three-axis uh, GFC 700 horse pilot, which is very capable, like I said. Uh, you can even have a weather radar fitted to this aircraft. All sorts of clever uh, optional extras you can have put in there. Storm scopes, weather radars, traffic alert systems, um, the anti-icing uh, kit that we have fitted to this aircraft, the uh, TKS, it's called, Weeping Wing. Um, it's got, uh, in terms of performance, it's got excellent fuel economy. Uh, you can sort of cruise along at about 75% power with 12 gallons per hour being burned. You've got about 50 gallons in the main tanks, another 26 in the auxiliaries. So you have 76 gallons, 12 gallons now. Yeah, f a fair bit of endurance, put it that way. So yeah, so the uh, the endurance is very good. But also the, the cruise speed is pretty damn good as well. Um, the the DA-40 C6 version, like I said, it tazzes out at almost 200 knots at higher altitudes if you have an oxygen fit on the aircraft. Um, at about 10,000 feet, which is what uh, you're restricted to without the oxygen, it'll tazz out at about 100 and 180 knots or so, uh, which is very, very good. And bur burning about 14 gallons an hour, that sort of power setting, um, so at max continuous. So very, very effective, very quick aeroplane, not burning a huge amount of, uh, of fuel. Only four seats in this aircraft, but then again, a lot of aircraft in this sort of size category have only got four seats. The, the cockpit's actually fairly cramped. It's not mega roomy in there. It, it's no bigger inside than a PA-28 or a Cessna 172 or something like that. Um, but that's uh, as a result of them trying to keep the, the width of the cockpit uh, fairly narrow, the width of the fuselage fairly narrow, fairly narrow to reduce drag. Um, the aircraft has got incredibly benign characteristics, stall characteristics. It's unbelievably difficult to get one of these things to spin um, or to snap on you or anything like that. Very, very occasionally I've managed to sort of get a slight wing drop out of one of these if you're quite aggressive. But I've been flying them for, I don't know, five, six years and nothing violent has ever happened to me in all the sort of uh, general handling 
flight training that I've been doing in them. So incredibly well designed when it comes to stability, which is incredibly important with any multi-engined aeroplane because if you uh, lose an engine and you've got an asymmetric scenario and the aircraft gets slow enough to stall, if you have an aircraft which is a little bit unstable and it will snap and spin on you, it's basically unrecoverable at that point. You can't recover from a spin in, um, in a multi-engine airplane or in the vast majority of multi-engine airplanes because all of your weight is out here on the wings and it uh, just provides a lot of centrifugal force to keep the aircraft just auto-rotating round and round all the way into the ground. So Diamond did a fantastic job of making sure this aircraft is, is almost spin-proof. Um, so there we go. Um, that's basically the, the introduction to the DA-42 that I, I usually give to students when I sit them down and I bore them to death about this aircraft uh, when they're going on to learn how to fly it. Um, it's significantly different to your average light aircraft. It's made of carbon fiber. It's got water-cooled engines. It's got geared engines. So there are uh, little helical gearboxes in there, which is something that most, um, the vast majority of light aircraft don't have. Only things like uh, Cessna 421 or something like that. Uh, it's glass cockpit. Um, there are no conventional gauges, no vacuum pump or anything like that. Um, the flight controls are different. Um, it's got the anti-icing. Um, turbocharged. So, and it's also, of course, it's, it's FADEC as well. So full authority digital engine control. So there's no blue levers or red levers or anything like that. There's just two throttle levers. It's, it's almost like a jet in that sense. Um, so for a lot of commercial pilot trainees who train on these things they are aiming to go off and fly for airlines so it's a good uh, it's a good primer really to get them into the the world of, of flying with just two levers and that's it of course if they go off to fly a turboprop they may have to relearn how to use a uh, how to use a propeller but still overall the da 42 has pretty much dominated or come to dominate the light piston twin training aircraft segment so the DA-42 is a huge commercial success and go to any flying school in the UK and Europe uh, and I'm sure you're going to be seeing them in the US all over the place as well. Um, you are likely to find these things and they are brilliant. If you get the chance to fly one, if you are a pilot, um, jump at it because it's it's brilliant to fly. Not so nice to taxi, but brilliant to, to fly. I'll get into that later. Anyway, uh, that's enough of me chatting and waxing lyrical about the DA-42. Suffice to say, it's an aeroplane that I am very fond of, and it's pretty much the main reason that uh, I'm still instructing today. Um, I would have probably given it up if I was flying around in, in old knackered piston twins that aren't as, uh, aren't as fun to fly as this one. Let's have a look at a few of these liveries. So it does come with an awful lot of them. Um, and we can see we've got the uh, the standard sort of diamond liveries now. Originally, the DA-42 was predominantly white because you have to be quite careful with painting um, composite airframes or putting colour into them. Um, but over time, diamond have gotten a lot better at that and they've uh, come up with a lot more fancy-looking colour schemes. The originals were just white and these were just stickers stuck onto the uh, onto the aircraft. But they're very nice looking. As you can see, various different stripes and winglets and things like that on them. This is the first one that's got a lick of paint. It's supposed to be silver. It looks a bit grey to me, but very nice, stylish looking uh, aircraft that. I think this is my favourite. Very, very cool to see a red one. Although I should be ideologically opposed to red, being a McLaren fan, but still. Very, uh, very stylish looking aeroplane, that. And now this is a, a free extra livery pack that you can get from the Orbex store, which is how you pick this aeroplane up at the moment. It's not uh, available on uh, the Microsoft Flight Simulator store just yet. Um, but they've included loads of different colour schemes from different flying schools. And you can go on the, the Cows Discord and you can suggest liveries from your flying school if you're training on one of these aircraft. And you can have your own, uh, your own livery on there. Um... I didn't actually put forward any of the any of our aircraft from from our flying school, but I didn't really want to to dox myself, so <laughs> I didn't suggest any of uh, any of our ones. But uh, this is cool. If you're an Embry Riddle student, you can have your own aeroplane. This one looks good. KLM Flight Academy. Ah yes, good old trailing edge, as <laughs> leading edge. As the students refer to it as, this is a major training school in the United Kingdom based at Oxford. 
very fancy, very shiny school with lots of new aeroplanes that charge a lot of money. And this one, pilot.no. No. <laughs> Good delivery, though. Nice. Nice and simple. And there we go. So, that's the DA-426. Now, there are two versions which are included with this. So, this is the 6. And this is the TDI. So, the TDI is almost identical. It's still got the, uh, the older 130 horsepower engines. I don't think... Uh, well, no, this definitely isn't the, the 155, the upgraded one, which is what our school tends to use. But you can see the, the, the cowlings are a slightly different design. The air intakes are a different shape. Uh, the exhausts and all that kind of stuff. Slightly more sort of bluff-looking um, engine cowlings. And apparently a little bit more draggy than the uh, the Sixers ones. Um, you can also see that the, um, the canopy is a little bit lower. Uh, and that's the... Uh, the headroom issue that the TDI has, but other than that, essentially the same aircraft, a little bit less performance. And you get three liveries with this one. You get uh, this one, which is uh, what our aircraft look like. Or this one is a classic one so we, we've we've got a few that look like this as well to be fair so there's not really much point in uh, in me asking for a specific airplane because they're, they're already basically in there anyway it's just the the specific regs i suppose so there we go that's the externals to have a look inside you can see for those of you who fly the um da62 it'll seem fairly familiar in here because most of the controls are very very similar to the da62 Got the G1000 uh, infamous glass panel. Those of you who are not fans of glass cockpits will probably not like this aeroplane because it is the, the arch glass cockpit user. You have a few standby instruments up here, airspeed, altitude, and electric gyro um, attitude indicator. Whiskey compass, um, but all the rest of it is all, uh, is all digital. Very, very well rendered, well designed. You can see uh, in the real aircraft you have a diamond logo on here, but unfortunately... As with the uh, the M500 that me and Nathan reviewed last time, uh, cows don't have permission to use the diamond logos, so they've just put their own logo on here. I'm sure there are going to be mods out there before the end of the weekend um, which have uh, the diamond logo included. I'm sure. So if you're that pedantic, you can have uh, you can have that on your aircraft, and you can just see just how nicely they've rendered all of this. Went to an awful lot of trouble. And obviously, I've seen the kind of process of the, the guys pulling their hair out, trying to, to make this model look as realistic as possible. Uh, see the textures on the anti-slip here, which is is a, is rubbish, basically. It's it's about as slippy as anti-slip coating gets. Uh, it just wears off over time, and then you inevitably climb out into the wing when it's a bit wet and fall off, which uh, definitely has never happened to me, not even once. Hmm. Um, yeah. So that's the, the interior. And the, and the 6 is, is broadly the same. We're going to fly the 6 for, for the review video, so I'll, uh, you'll see the inside of the 6. It's just a few different switches down here that marks it out. So there we go. That's the exterior and the interior and a little bit of history about the real aircraft. So now, without further delay, let's get into the sim and have a fly around. Okay, so here we are in the simulator on the ground here at Doncaster Sheffield Airport in the north of the UK where we always start off on these review videos. We've got our DA42 loaded up fully, 100% max takeoff weight so we can do our performance checks and we are pretty much ready to go but I just thought I'd just have a little look at how everything looks with the aircraft in the in-sim lighting. It looks absolutely gorgeous, I think. The external model has been... Um, basically completely redone with only a sort of a couple of weeks to go before release. Um, I think the chap who, who did that uh, has done an absolutely awesome job with it. So hats off to him. A few names that you might recognize who helped develop this aircraft, by the way. You've got um, Mr. Tommy MXR, who made the DA62X mod, which I recommend you all go out and get because it's fantastic. That's the one of the first things I flew in this simulator on, on a video. Um, trying to show you multi-engine training uh, much, much better than the default DA62. Recommend you go and pick that up from flightsim.to. It's completely free. 
Uh, and also the sounds were done by uh, Boris, the famous Boris, who did all of the sounds on the Flyby Wire, uh, A320, and all a, a whole bunch of other projects. Um, he is absolutely fantastic at his job, and it was a real privilege to be able to provide him with some audio files to help him make this uh, this sound model, although I think um, they were the TDI ones that I did, not the, the six. Um, but anyway, there we go. Um, so that's the way things look in there. We've got no kind of fancy chocks or ground equipment or anything like that with this aircraft, which is not the end of the world. It's uh, It's a fairly basic light aircraft at the end of the day you're not going to have a pushback to tug or anything like that uh, the vast majority of the time or a gpu or what have you um, but maybe maybe some chocks or, or a tow bar or something like the the just fly aircraft might might be something to add at some point in the future if the uh, the guys aren't too completely exhausted from uh, getting the aircraft to this state so let's get on board now i have a checklist with me it's my flying schools checklist but there is plenty of documentation included with this aircraft, included its own checklist. Plus, it's got the all-important in-game checklist as well. So all of that stuff is available to you. It's not a particularly difficult aircraft to operate or fly in the simulator. Uh, but for all of you guys who are starting out um, with it, uh, with no experience in the DA-42, it should certainly help you. As you can see, we can uh, pop the canopy up. It's something quite unique to the 42. In fact, you've got a canopy instead of a door. Uh, and, you can the, and the rear door works as well, so we can uh, pop that open too. Uh, there we go. In real life, it's kind of a two-stage thing. You have to pull that little thing, but a little bit easier in the sim. There we go. Right. So, one more thing to show you before we get flying. I'm just going to pop the electric master on. Position lights, of course. And get things fired up, because I want to show you the damage and state saving system. So... Once it's fired up, what you can do to set this up is you press and hold the right ECU test button. And you can see it's state save enabled. So I've set this up because I like the airplane to, to remember how I had it set up previously. Um, now if I wanted to change that, I'd flip down the ECU into ECU B and then press that button again and that would toggle it off. So that's the um, state saving. Okay, so when you hit the left ECU test button here, that's how you enable the damage. You can see I've got it enabled here. So that will allow you to damage the engines by overstressing them, uh, overspeeding the props, all of that kind of stuff. It's very, very difficult to, to damage the engines on a DA-42 because so much of it is controlled electronically by the clever little computer brains in each engine. But um, you have the option to turn it off if you really want to do some crazy aerobatics or whatever. Uh, and how you do it is exactly the same as the state saving, so except it's left ECU test button. Um, voter down on this side, there we go, I think, there we go, damage toggle, and then you would press that again to turn it off, so there we go, and if you want to come out of that mode, you press, there's a secret button in between that allows you to press both at the same time, press that and it'll come out of it. So there we go, right, Bef without further ado, let's crack on. So, before starting checklist, so the pre-flight checklist will assume is complete, baggage and tow bar secured, auxiliary pumps, so we've got auxiliary pumps down here, these are for the um, auxiliary fuel tanks which live in the back of the engine the cells. You can just see the fillers for them here. Uh, as I said, there's 26 gallons, 13 per side in that, 50 in the main tanks. So the aux pumps are off. Power selectors, uh, sorry, fuel selectors, uh, are in the on position. Power levers are idle. There we go, we've got them in idle. Um, I'm using my Warthog setup, by the way, today, not my usual honeycomb, because obviously I need a stick. Um, and it's a little bit awkward to have the, just the honeycomb throttle on my desk, um, because the, the Warthog stick kind of has to be on the same side as the throttle. So, a little bit of a different setup today. Anyway, um, parking brake set. So, we've got the parking brake in the set position. You can see uh, it's kind of, this, this is something that uh, an instructor I work with really complains about, because when the defrosting in the cabin air are up like that, that means they're on. So surely you'd think that the parking brake, when that is up, it's on when it's up. But no, it's it's the opposite, it's the other way around. So when the, the parking brake is down here, it's on. Now in the real aircraft, you have to squeeze the tow brakes for first, 
Uh, so you squeeze the brakes and then pull it down, which is exactly how the parking brake on a 737 works. Um, in the sim, you can just flick the, flick the switch. But don't expect to do that in the real thing. Um, alternate air closed. So the alternate air is over here. We've only got one. It operates both engines, so you make sure it's pushed away from you and closed. Manual gear extension handle, it's over on this side, it's pushed away and closed. Gear selector down, it is. Uh, avionics masters off. Electric master is off. Engine masters, that's these two big toggles here, are both off. Pito heat, this big one here, is off. Alternate static is underneath the panel here. So the alternate static is in the off position. I don't believe we can open that. Oh, no, it's not openable, but it is there. It is modelled, at least. Alternators should be both on. That's these two here. They just stay on all the time, unless you need to turn them off with a failure. Um, ECU swap should be in auto. That's the middle position, which it is. Um, all light switches should be off. Uh, we've got the position lights on, but that's fine, because they should come on with the battery. That's how we usually leave it with our flying school. Emergency switch off and guarded, so that's the uh, backup battery system. All it does is it runs the electric gyro for the attitude indicator and the overhead light in the event of a total electrical failure, but it's a single-use battery, so if you turn that thing on, then the battery will start discharging, and then you have to replace the whole battery. So the, hence why uh, there's, a, there's a wire through that to stop people inadvertently lifting that switch guard and turning the battery on and uh, wiping it out, costing the flying school or the owner a load of money. ELT is in the armed position, which it is. Circuit breakers are all in, and our circuit breakers on this airplane are all operational, and they have the desired effect on the individual aircraft system, so that's all modelled, <coughs> PMDG. And flap selector is in the up position, which it is there. Uh, okay, so we can pop the electric master switch on. Position light's already on. You can see the electric gyro in the attitude indicator running up there which is exactly what it does in the real airplane really really good there rudder pedals adjusted so um, you either have on the older aircraft you have a metal thing here and you pull the rudder pedals towards you push them away from you with your feet uh, on this aircraft it's a little bit more fancy you've got a switch and it's all electrical which is very high tech for a light aircraft flight controls checked so we just make sure we got full and free around the box which we do that's looking good and also, uh, because it's a semi-castering nose wheel on the DA-42, you can actually move the, uh, the rudder pedals as well, make sure they're free. Um, trims should be uh, checked. So, first flight of the day, we always wind full travel. Nose down. Nose up, and you should be able to see behind the little trim tab here. Moving into position. So, there we go. Something that you maybe wouldn't see on the real aircraft is the is the sticks moving with it, unless there was a lot of air flowing over it, because essentially the all you're doing with the control here is moving the trim tab. Um, rudder trim, very, very important in a multi-engine airplane that you check you've got full rudder trim deflection, uh, because if you have an engine failure, especially with quite a powerful light twin-engine airplane, you need a lot of rudder trim to counteract that. So we'll make sure we've got it all available bear with. Okay, there we go. That was a bit of a chore, but never mind. <laughs> um, okay, gear warning, lights, and fire detector. So this is this little button here. So you press that, you get the red light just underneath it for the gear warning, you get the annoying Check noise, gear. and that lady, and you also get the high-pitched beeping from the engine fire warnings on the, um, on the PFD there, and the flashing red master warning. So that's all present and correct. Uh, De-icing enunciator test, so you flip this down, the ice light switch, you flip it down to the enunciator test position. It takes two minutes, and then it should come up with a uh, master caution um, de-ice low pressure on the PFD. Um, so, let's click through that. And windscreen de-icing pump one and two checked. So, I mean, you can do that, um, but just don't make sure you don't do it on a day where... You're just about to go flying because it sprays the windscreen with um, de-icing fluid. Oh yeah, that was going to describe the de-icing system on this aircraft, so I'll, I'll do that as we set up. So the de-icing on this aircraft isn't boots or heated elements like it is in a lot of aircraft. It's actually, you have a tank in the nose full of uh, fluid called TKS, 
and the TKS fluid weeps out of thousands of tiny, tiny, tiny holes in these metal panels here, here, and on the leading edge of the vertical surface here. Uh, it also has l tiny tubes just in front of the props there. You can just about see them poking out of the spinner just there, um, which sprays fluid from a... There's a slinger ring inside the spinner there, which centrifugally throws the fluid out down the length of the, the prop blades. And these rubber bits here uh, have grooves cut into them in order to direct the fluid up the, the length of the blade. So... Um, interesting system it's very uh, it's, it's decent it's fairly effective it's a lot lighter than a lot of anti-icing systems um, on for example like a pneumatic anti-icing system would be a lot heavier and a lot more complicated than this uh, the downside is you are limited to flying in icing conditions so long as you have fluid and you have two and a half hours worth of fluid on board the aircraft uh, with it in the normal setting which is the the anti-icing rather than the de-icing setting so a um, bit limited in terms of your flight endurance in icing conditions if you are going to be spending the whole flight flying through uh, cloud and obviously below icing temperatures, which for the in terms of the book, the book says icing conditions are visible moisture below 3 degrees, and that's our de-ice pressure load coming up there, so that's telling us that our enunciator test has completed, so we can flip that up there. Um, flaps to landing, so we're going to check the flap travel. So I always do this in, in stages to check that the indicator light works and obviously agrees with what we're seeing outside the aircraft there. Slightly different speeds on the TDI and the 6, so pay attention to this uh, handy dandy uh, caption next to the flap lever. Depending on what version you're flying, that tends to catch me out because I do fly both versions. Um, and then we check the ele variable elevator backstop. So the variable ele elevator backstop is a device to prevent you from over, over pitching the aircraft on go around. So if you apply full back pressure here and then push the throttles forward past about 25% or something like that, you'll hear that little motor engaging and the backstop will push the stick forward. And then you pull the power back and the backstop will wind back again. You can hear the little motor working. Very, very nicely done there. Um, then we select the flaps back into the up position, which we have. Uh, passengers, uh, we don't have any. Seatbelts fastened, yeah, fine. Rear door closed and latched, so let's get the door back down again. There we go. Lovely little squeaky sound there to accompany that. Front canopy position one or two. So, uh, in real life, you can actually latch the canopy up. There's an extra little hole there for the latches to go into, and you can crack the canopy open while you taxi around on really hot days. Um, it's not something that they've modelled in uh, in this model, so it's a tiny little thing there that they, uh, they maybe could have done to make it slightly more realistic, but I'm really splitting hairs here. I'm trying to do that whole uh, be as honest as possible thing here. Um, so that's that. G1000 powered at knowledge. Yeah, we're good. We've uh, powered up. We're draining the battery, so let's uh, hurry up. MFD. So what we'd normally do here is we'd go back up, and then we'd, on this side, first of all, we check. Uh, see that this is a limitation. This isn't Cows' fault. So normally what we do is, you see the, the two are just mirroring each other. Um, and also, you, instead of lean, you'd have fuel system engine. And on the fuel page, we take a note of the time in service, um, which is basically the Hobbs meter for the tech log, and also check how much fuel you've got on board, um, and reset the fuel calculator as well. Now, these are things that you can't do on this model, not because it's an oversight by the developers, but because it uses the working title G1000 system, and working title haven't got round to implementing any of those things. Now, you they could have, have spent a huge, huge amount of time and effort trying to custom code all of that, but I don't blame them for not doing it because it would be unbelievably difficult. So, unfortunately, you can't do any of that stuff that we would do in the aircraft. Normally, we, we start with the display backup turned on, and on this side, we'll have the engine, and on this side, we'll have the system, so you can check all of the uh, temperatures and pressures, most importantly, all pressure, uh, and the volts and amps as well at the same time to make sure the electrics are all working. Sadly, you can't do that, so it's not much point in me, uh, in me going through that process. But we'll check the fuel. That's good. Fuel calculators uh, reset already automatically, so don't need to worry about that. Okay, fuel temperatures. So that's on the, the main page here, so the fuel temperatures in the green. You can operate in the green or the yellow, 
with Jet A1 on board, with diesel on board, because you can run on either with these engines, Jet A1 or diesel fuel. You can only operate in the green band with diesel fuel. Total time of service, yeah, okay, fair enough, got five hours on there. Uh, MFD to system. So uh, let's flip over to system there. We've done the de-icing and unstated test. The start key is inserted there, looking very good. Uh, power levers are both idle. Avionics master, we don't need to put on, so this is if you need to call for start, but we're not doing anything like that. Um, position lights are on. Propeller area is clear. And engine master on, so let's start the left engine first. Shut up. Now, in the real aircraft, from what I recall, with the avionics master off, you wouldn't be getting that bonging, but... I may be mistaken because this is a newer version of the G1000 that our aircraft have. So it goes through a glow cycle when you flip that master switch on. So it's got glow plugs just like a diesel engine in a car. It glows, heats up the cylinders, and when it's done, the caption goes out and you're ready to start. So we'll have a good look around. We'll flip the key. If I can get. So this is a little bit of an annoyance. The click spot's a bit sort of. Two hours later there we go finally got there so yeah could do with a click spot for turning the key left to be a little bit bigger to my credit I did actually bring that up but never mind um, so there we go so uh, T's and P's first of all so oil pressures in the green and volts and amps are green we got no fire Nothing visibly leaking out of there. The amps are back in the green, so we can hit the master for the other side. See the glow caption on there. It's gone out, which means we're ready to start. There we go. Oil pressure's immediately coming up there. We've got no fire. And volt snaps are all green. See the coolant and uh, oil temperature is a little on the low side, but that's obviously because we've just started the aircraft. Uh, it's all ISA basic uh, standard temperatures. It's 15 degrees in the sim today, so it's not mega cold or anything. So it shouldn't take too long for us to warm up. Um, so there we go. Check after engine start. All pressures in green. Yeah, RPM should be 900 there or thereabouts. Uh, 700, but different engine version to what this checklist is for, so that's fine. Warm up time. So yeah, we could start a timer for uh, a warm up. You need perhaps sort of three minutes. For that, but um, well, two minutes actually, but um, just until oil and coolant are over 50 degrees. But I think we're going to have that by the time we taxi out. Fuel selector should go to cross feed, so let's set that just to uh, check that it works. So this is the only time you ever use both cross feeds at the same time. It has to be up for at least 30 seconds that you do this. Um, we'll go back over onto the system page and we'll check the pizza heat. Come on on there go out and the amps spike up and then spike back down again as you add the load so that's all good avionics mask can come on now it's going to turn all our radios and other bits and bobs on so that's booting up now normally what we do at this point is we put the flight plan in and we then check all of the auxiliary pages so we'd go over to the orgs here um, and do all sorts of go through all the different pages here. Make sure all the setup is is as we uh, as we need. Uh, unfortunately, you can't change a lot of these things at the moment. Uh, you can change some of them. Um, yeah, okay. You can change some of these things. Tars system test. Okay. Uh, but you can't change any of these alerts. Uh, you can change this. So hang on. So can I have instead of on route? What can I have? Can I have an MSA? That's usually my favourite thing to have up here. No, sadly not. Okay. Well, close enough. It's it's better. It's better than when I last checked this. Um, but. Like uh, yeah, things like transition altitude you can't change, uh, or you can't turn that alert on either. It'll make the uh, the Barra reference flash blue when you pass the transition altitude alert to remind you to set standard. 
um, so that's not yet available. This is all working title stuff though, it's nothing that cows can control unfortunately, so um, there we go. That's normally what we do, we go through all of these settings. Um, there are a lot more in the real aircraft, there's GPS uh, pages and all that kind of stuff where you can check and run a rain check on the GPS um, and check the system fidelity. Uh, rain is receiver autonomous integrity monitoring, it's, um, it's basically what you need to fly a, a GPS approach, precision approach. So you need to check you've got the required rain available before you can do that. Uh, none of that's available in the, the working title G1000 at the moment, so sadly I can't show you all of that stuff, but um, at least we've got a few a few options on here. That's a little bit more than the last time I checked it, actually. Uh, so the, yeah, the G1000, working title G1000 is, is a work in progress. It's, it's getting better a little bit at the time. Um, so that's that in terms of uh, performance. So we can set whatever we want on here. Um, now they're all quite helpfully set up correctly for you. All of our uh, TDIs are, all of these are wrong because they still come up as default as the speeds for the, the non-CD155, which is slightly different to the CD155, which is one of my bugbears. You have to reset all of these every single time you fly the airplane, but I digress. Autopilot test, so you do a quick AP test to make sure it does what it should do. So let's run through that and see if it does what it should. So on heading bug, autopilot on, and heading bug. Oh, it's not going to do anything, but I put it in heading mode. There we go, heading. There we go, yeah. You can see it's following the stick very nicely there. So the flight director is moving as it should. Back to the middle. And if we put it in VS and give it a climb, it should come back, which it is. You see the trim moving as well. And forward should do the opposite. You see the warning coming up on there as well. And the stick's moving forward and the trim's moving forward. So, yeah, really, really good there. Um, you've got the control wheel steering mode on the front of the stick here, so you'd usually check the control wheel steering and check that it cuts the autopilot out and gives you full and free movement of the stick. Um, but obviously there's not much point in having that in the simulator, so it's not modelled. And autopilot disconnect, there we go, gives you full control of the aircraft back again. Get rid of the uh, flight director too. So yeah, fantastic. A lot of aircraft in Microsoft Flight Simulator, you can't do that um, autopilot test because the, the controls don't follow the, the flight director like they should do on the ground. But with this aircraft it works perfectly, so great job with that. Flood lights is required, don't need that. Fuel selectors, we've been 30 seconds now, so they can go back to on. Uh, ATIS, we don't have the weather's lovely uh, altimeters. <laughs> so I'll just show you how to do this. The barrow, this is one of my sort of little bugbears about the aircraft. The, the barrow setting uh, knob is a bit weird. It's on the same one as the course, um, which is kind of rubbish. So it's 10.13 on there. And now I'll just beat for that one. There we go, 10.13 on both. Uh, with some TDIs, they have um, cap, cap something or other, cap 140, I think, autopilot down here, uh, which also has its own altitude selector, so you've got three altim altimeters to work with, but thankfully we don't have that hateful piece of equipment to deal with in this aircraft. We've got the nice integrated GFC 700, and then long press clear should take us back to the map. And thank you, working title, it doesn't at the moment. So there we go. There's a lot of other cool things on here, like you've got the... Um, charts on here with Navigraph charts. If you've got Navigraph subscription, you can get a, a chart up and all that kind of good stuff. I'll show you a little bit more of that later on in the flight. Uh, but yeah, it's still uh, a few little bugbears, a few little shortcomings with the uh, working title at the moment. Uh, standby horizon, so there, that's good. We'll pull that out, make sure it's aligned. Transponder, mode and code. So normally we'd have ground mode on this, which automatically flips to out reporting when you get airborne. Again, working title, they don't have it yet. We've got 7,000 on here on standby, so that's fine. Uh, we'll just have to pretend we've got a sort of partially operating transponder, which I had on, on an aircraft a while back. Text clearance we don't need. Position and taxi lights on, parking brake release. We are good to go. So, taxi lights coming on. Parking brakes released. Let's go. So a quick note about taxiing the DA42. Um, it's not the best aeroplane in the world on the taxi. The, like I mentioned earlier, it's a semi-castering nose wheel, so the aircraft kind of goes where it wants. Um, 
and requires quite a lot of uh, a lot of brake and also I tend to use quite a lot of differential thrust in the real aircraft which really helps one of the great things about this uh, model is that it kind of has that so it kind of wanders around on the ground like just like the real thing does it means you have to, to be sort of quite active on the pedals use the diff brakes as required use the differential thrust as required so yeah it's all present and correct we'll be doing an instrument check as we uh, as we taxi out as well to make sure everything turns in the same direction everything else is stable tank coordinator works as it should and the little trend vector little purple trend vector on the top here i'm sure you're all familiar with the g1000 equipment at this point see the lights nice little representation of those uh, lovely led external lights that you have on uh, the later versions of the DA42 taxi like that on the belly it's very bright for HID great for uh, conspicuity okay I'm gonna stop here now with most light aircraft you turn into the wind because it gives better cooling airflow through the uh, through the air intakes it's a water-cooled aeroplane, so it really doesn't matter all that much in the DA42, so I, I don't usually really bother. Okay, the brakes are checked, instruments are checked, nose wheel steering's fine. Parking brake is set, seat belts fastened, rear doors closed and latched, front canopies closed, front baggage doors are all closed, door warning lights out, engine instruments. We are now in the green across the board, so let's just check the systems as well. Uh, yeah, all presses a little low, that's just because we're idle, so that's fine. Uh, fuel temperature is in the green, circuit breakers are all checked, electric elevator trim set take off. Um, this is a good reminder because when you do the autopilot check it obviously winds itself back to the board so you need to make sure you reset it to take off. Uh, fuel selectors are checked on, rudder trim is, so you can, some people like to, to give it a little bit of right rudder trim to help with the yaw forces on takeoff because these are not counter rotating engines, they both spin to the right as we're looking at them at the moment. So the aircraft yours to the left on takeoff. Uh, I don't generally bother. I just leave it in the middle. Usually, I'm just used to it, just cancelling it out with uh, with rudder pressure. Flaps are up and indicating. Uh, flight controls. So we'll do our usual check: left hand down, left side up, other side opposite, right hand down, right side up, other side opposite, full aft, full forward. You can just about see the uh, the elevator behind you there in the real aircraft and full left and full right on the pedals, that's all checked. Power levers are idle, ECU test. If you're familiar with uh, Tommy's DA62 mod, he's got the exact same thing in there. So it's the same story, you can press the, the center part here to press both of them at the same time. And the engines are gonna run through their pre-flight tests. So we're gonna go up to about 40% on the load. ECU fail, A and B, it's gonna cycle the props. again and the prop cycle captions go out tests complete happy days then we test the ECU swap so we're gonna in auto it should default to A so we're gonna flip it to B check for any change back up same on this side and change much smoother in the um, uh, Ostro engine uh, DA42 in the TDI you actually get a little kick you flip that over it's a little bit more crude pta is going to come on in a second ice protection we don't need transponder mode and code for now is fine we'll do it on the lineup mfd is set to the engine page which is default departure cleanse we don't need parking brake release and then it's just the lineup procedure okay parking brake off let's line up in fact before i do that let's uh, put a headset on lovely noise cancelling headset thank you boris um <laughs> Quite a uh, quite a loud aeroplane. Uh, well, yeah, it's it's not as loud as some, but it's nice to have something like that while I'm talking to you. So fantastic, well done, Boris, for including that. Um, so ATPL approach pass clear. Transponder is out reporting. Peter heat's coming on, and all of the lights. We are good to go. So we should be expecting in the region of 1,100 feet per minute on climb out once we've set climb power. So auxiliary pumps coming on as well. Um, I need to remember because this is something you don't do on the TDI, which you do do on the um, on the 
uh, on the Ostro, on the NG, on the 6. Um, so you set climb power. I usually use 500 feet AGL. It's 50 foot elevation here, so we'll use 550 on the altimeter. We set climb power to 92%, which is max continuous. So first of all, we'll run up. So I usually go for 40% T's and P's. And then we go full power, we check, we get 100% on the loads, props bite in, and then full power away we go. Plenty of right pedal, air speed's alive. You can see the stall heat fail captions come up there, that's normal, that's activated by the weight and wheel switch, it'll go off in flight. Looking for 76, there it is, rotate, fairly light on the stick, not a huge amount of effort to pull it airborne. And we climb straight ahead until we're above takeoff safety speed of 82 knots and we've got a positive rate of climb. And the gear can come up. Not set a target altitude on the altitude alerter because I'm rubbish. Let's get a 4,000 feet. So we'll climb out of blue line initially. You can see we're getting about 1,100 feet per minute or so. Uh, and when I come back to climb power, that should settle nicely. So. As you would expect of an aeroplane uh, which uh, I had a hand in developing, <laughs> flies the book figures. See it's going up and down a little bit, that's more to do with my rubbish flying than, uh, than an inaccuracy there, just need to hold a pitch. Usually you want about 11 degrees or so nose up I tend to find to maintain VY one of these and this is one of the things that I'm, I'm going to show you later it the pitch and power for this thing is absolutely spot on uh, not that you usually fly a light aircraft by pitch and power normally you just look outside but if you do want to fly it more like an airliner you can absolutely do that with this airplane it works perfectly and it, it is something I teach students to be a little bit sneaky with and use from time to time so the climb performance is looking great we can do our after takeoff check so the flaps are up the lights can come out, uh, the T's and P's are in the green, attitude and trim are set for the climb, sort of. Need a little bit more nose up I think here. That's better. So yeah, from my point of view, the takeoff feels absolutely spot on, the amount of stick pressure required, the rudder, uh, the sensitivity of the aircraft and you can really fly this thing with the smallest stick inputs it's very very accurate which is just like the real airplane the real airplane I usually um, show students that you can fly around just with a couple of fingers tips on the uh, on the stick and uh, you can absolutely do that in here with the benefit of the lovely warthog stick of course your mileage may vary depending on what you use uh, unfortunately the variability factor of um, peripherals in flight simulator one to go it means that not all of you are going to have the same experience unfortunately but certainly with this equipment uh, it flies absolutely beautifully okay so I'll do my best to level us off at 4,000 feet uh, we'll have a look at the cruise performance of the aircraft. So, although obviously my flying is incredibly accurate, uh, I think the autopilot might be a little bit better than me, so I'm going to pop that in in a second, because it'll just make life a touch easier for us. There we go, and we'll go for heading and uh, altitude. So we should be getting a TAS at this altitude of about 170 knots at this power setting. So let me just squeak it back very slightly because it should be 92, not 93 and 4. There we go. Um, so let's see what she TAS is out at. We've got our TAS indicated very helpfully down there. See we're going straight into the yellow here, which is normal for uh, one of these aircraft at this sort of power setting. It's fine, we're in smooth air. The only bumps we're getting are from uh, thermals. There we go. Settled out. 170 knots. How about that for accuracy? Absolutely spot on.
beautiful work there from uh, from the guys. Did you expect anything less? Right. So let's bring the power back now. Let's go for more of a sort of general handling cruise. So I'm going to pull the power back to about 40, 45%, something like that. Um, we're aiming for about 120 knots now, just so we can get our general handling done. I'm going to take the aircraft out a little bit further east. Missing my uh, Bravo with the heading selector on it, but never mind. Okay, so first little general handling maneuver we're going to uh, look at. As I add a little bit more power here because I kind of underestimated it slightly. Probably want to go for about 50% maybe. There we go. Um, is steep turns. So this is one of the ones where that kind of pitch and power thing I was telling you about should work really, really well. So I'm going to pop the autopilot off and get rid of the uh, flight director and the yaw damper as well. So the way that I help students out, shall we say, who are struggling with this a little bit, is for 120 knots, steep turn, have a good look out in the direction again, we'll go to the left, um, we'll roll in, 45 degree angler bank, we add about 10% power, and we pitch to the 2.5 degree line on the attitude indicator. And if I can nail that, as you can see, we've got now, look how stable that is. Perfectly on speed, perfectly on altitude, maintaining its bank angle beautifully. This is exactly how the real aeroplane does it. This is so spot on, I cannot begin to describe how, uh, how much of a, a nerdgasm this is giving me, because this is exactly how the real aeroplane works. So they've got this so spot on and then 15 degrees to go. Roll out with a little bit of help from the opposite rudder. We don't need an awful lot, and then we need to push off that back pressure. And remember to reset our power, which I've done a little bit too much of there. There we go. So there we go. The, the pitch and power settings for a steep turn just work absolutely spot on as they do in the real aeroplane. So it's so cool to see that. Uh, I can demonstrate it in the other direction if you really want to, to see that. Believe me, it does work both ways. a little bit, 10% uh, power increase from whatever you had it for the cruise, 2.5 degrees pitch up, 45 degrees angler bank, just enough rudder to keep the ball in the middle and just hold it and it will go around so easily. Uh, it's so much easier to do this than in something like the Arrow, which is a, a fight with the controls and you're kind of balanced on a knife edge as well, I say as I lose it a little bit there, but essentially you just you find a sweet spot and you just hold it and it will just go around so well. So complete non-event. Roll out, a little bit of help from the opposite rudder. Take that 10% back off again. And then remember to push off the back pressure back to uh, back to your straight and level attitude. And there you go. So yeah, steep turns, absolutely spot on. Genuinely, I, I don't think I've flown another aeroplane in this simulator that does steep turns as well as this one does. Um, I mean, granted, I've not flown a 4 and 4 in real life or a 310 or what have you, but certainly in terms of the airplane I've flown in real life versus the simulator, this is the best correlation as far as that maneuver is concerned. So really, really cool to see that. Um, usual sort of couple between rudder and roll. You can see that the uh, applying a little bit of rudder gives, I'm not touching the stick at all now, gives the appropriate amount of roll and throws the aircraft into a spiral descent. So that's exactly what I would be demonstrating to students um, as they fly this aeroplane for the first time. You can take them out and do, uh, do all these maneuvers with them. Um, of course, one of the most important things you do with the students in this aircraft is demonstrate the effects of engine failures. So if I was to pull one of the throttles all the way back to idle. You can see how that exact same scenario is being set up. I'm not touching the controls Check here. Gear. She's just descending into a spiral descent and I just close both throttles and recover. So Check again, gear. exactly how it happens in the real aeroplane. Really, really nicely done. And that's 
as far as I'm concerned, the selling point of any Microsoft Flight Simulator airplane is how it flies, how it hand flies, and uh, this one is certainly performing spot on at the moment. Let's get into the next manoeuvre, shall we? So the next manoeuvre is going to be our good old, uh, our good old stall. So when it's me and Nathan, I somehow manage to kill myself every time I do this, but hopefully uh, this time things will be a little bit more under control. I think Nathan's just a bad luck. Um, so uh, we'll do a, a sort of mini hazel check, so height sufficient, airframes clean, safety and security is good, engine T's and P's are all good, no captions, location's fine, look out, we don't need to do because we're on our own in the simulator. Let's do it. So normally we do a clearing turn as well, but we can omit that for the sake of brevity. Check gear. Idle on both throttles. Pitch to maintain straight and level. Keep the ball in the middle. A little bit of gear. trim to help, but nothing below 80 knots. Check gear. That lady is very annoying. Now what we should be seeing is an Check unbelievably gear. benign stall characteristic here. No wing dropping, nothing Check nasty gear. like that. Almost, you can't even tell when this aircraft is stalled. And yeah, there we go, she's stalled. Check the the nose is just nodding down now. So this is fully stalled. We can see the rate of descent going down. Check and the nose is just gear. nodding up and down because I'm holding the stick back and forcing it to stay stalled. So I could just recover from this without Check using any gear. power at all, just by lowering the nose. All, all I need to do to unstall this. Then we're back under Check full control gear. again. Now obviously, Normally, you'd do a standard stall recovery where you add your full power back in and pitch to VY. That's what an examiner would be looking for on a commercial pilot's license or an instrument rating skills test if he asks you to demonstrate that maneuver. But um, suffice to say, spot on, absolutely perfect. Now, I can demonstrate that um, in a dirty configuration, in a landing configuration, for example. So I'll do that now. Just got to get the aircraft configured, so we'll reclimb first. Level off. And reset the power and the trim. Lovely relationship between yaw and power setting and speed, by the way. Really, really good. Anyway, um, so uh, get out. Speed below 194 and speed below 133 flaps approach and speed below 113 flaps landing. Now, the landing flap is very, very draggy in this aeroplane, so normally you'd select the drag flap after you'd done your clearing turn, but like I said, we're going straight into the maneuver, so we don't need to worry too much about that. And just to complicate matters a little bit, let's leave a little bit of power on and do a slight power on stall and see how. Uh, how that affects, so stalling in a much lower nose attitude and a much lower airspeed this time. Might get a little bit of a wing drop, but we'll see. Nope. Just the nose nodding down like that, airspeed increasing, then coming back up again as the tail regains authority. It's, it's unbelievably good. Absolutely spot on. Okay, so we'll reset the attitude for the climb. Uh, flaps coming back up to approach. Move for positive rate climb, positive rate climb, we have gears coming up. Let's get that VY nailed. Still positive. Flaps up. Climb power. Yeah, so I'm going to pat myself on the back there because I think uh, I've done a very good job with this. <laughs> no, who, who, the, who has done a very, very good job with the flight model of this aeroplane is, is Mr. Tommy. He has um, nailed this so so well um, so to, to have any sort of input on something which has turned out so beautifully is um, is really nice I guess right so there's your, your standard sort of maneuvers um, not a huge amount of uh, a systems to, to show off or demonstrate um, Obviously, turbocharged aeroplanes, so the power isn't going to start winding back until you pass critical altitude, which is 12,000 feet off the top of my head. Um, but other than that, pretty basic. Two engines, two levers, not much to, to show off, really. There's the uh, the fuel system. So the way the fuel system in this aircraft works, I'll just describe that as we're cruising along back towards... In fact, I'll tell you what, let's put the autopilot on, and I can uh, pop a route in. So let's go here and... Uh, 
put our good old Nottingham in here. Obviously, real aircraft, uh, your your origin would be automatically populated by the G1000. Working title don't quite have that implemented just yet. So Nottingham's going in there as the destination. We're going to pick runway 27. Enter. And then we can just give us a direct two. There we go. And uh, purple needles. Nav. As it's doing that, now we can, just like we did with the the Mooney, put an approach in. Now there aren't any published approaches for Nottingham, but we can do a visual to runway 27 by this straight in point here. Uh, put some sensible minimums in. Let's say 550 or something along those sorts of lines. And if we hit activate. There we go. It's even going to give us a vertical profile down, just like it did with the M500. Uh, we want to be at 1,800 feet for the start of this one, so let's start coming down. Uh, in fact, let's go... And now we have a flight that will change. There we go. And we'll speed up a bit to facilitate a higher rate of descent. Don't go too crazy, though. see the target rate descent there. So we actually have a VNAV mode that we can arm there, but it will only come in when you uh, you get onto the VNAV glide path, which we're a bit above at the moment. So that's how you set that up. It's exactly the same as you do it in the M500. If you want to see uh, how to set all that up in a little bit more detail, go watch the M500 video. If you can deal with the slightly wonky um, quality in that one, I'm afraid that's OBS's fault, not YouTube's. There's nothing I can do about that. So really sorry about that. But hopefully this one's looking a lot sharper. I've messed around with OBS in this one. So there we go. Right. We can see that the autopilot and the systems on this aircraft are very, very capable for more average stuff. If you want to get really in-depth with things, then maybe this, uh, this ain't the one just yet. But uh, in terms of day-to-day -day flying, you've definitely got all the systems you need. Now, quick note about planning descents. It's normally your usual three times your ground, your, um, your height, five times your ground speed for working out your target rate descent if you don't have this little purple thing to help you. And one of the things that I tend to do with the power settings of this aircraft, so for every 100 feet per minute you want to come down, you want a 5% reduction in power. So if you want a 1,000 feet per minute descent, you want to come down 50%. Um, so let's go back to my little change. Uh, you can want to come back 50% on the power. That should give you... Uh, a stable airspeed at that rate of descent. In fact, let's uh, let's go into VS and select that as a target rate of descent. And I'll just pull the pad back as far as I can. That's just on top of the uh, the point where the gear warning horn is going to be going off. Now, if I pull it back below that, you can hear the prop RPM going up. That's the props going into disc mode, and now you can Check see a significant gear. reduction in airspeed. So the props have basically flattened themselves into the airflow, and they're acting like Check air brakes gear. at the moment, which is very handy if you need to drop a lot of altitude and speed quickly. Check gear. But unfortunately, you get the gear warning horn going off constantly, and there's no gear warning horn cutout on this aircraft. So generally, it's frowned upon to be flying along for long periods of time um, in that mode, just because means you kind of get used to your gear warning horn, which is not great. Uh, what's the next point? 919 feet. We'll go down to 900. And we'll arm the approach. So you can see it's doing all of this for me. Still our pre-joining checks, so uh, let's get some landing gear down, actually. Speed below 194. The great thing about the DA-42 is the gear limiting speed is your VNE. Um, or almost your VNE. It's actually 188, sorry, on the... Um, on the AE6, uh, it's a little bit lower than the it is on the TDI. But it's near enough your VNE. So, at pretty much any speed you can get your gear down. Your gear's quite draggy, and you can see the speed's coming back under control now. We're actually below 133, so we can get approach flap in as well. And we're aiming to get the speed back to about 100 knots for the approach. 
So fuel's in balance. We need, we've got a five gallon maximum in balance for landing. As you can see, we're below that. We've got plenty of fuel on board and it's all in balance. Uh, radios are all set. Mixtures we don't have on this aircraft. Altimeter set airfield Q and H. Want to go. But we're in approach mode, so it shouldn't level off. Uh, so disregard that. Um, and DI is in approach, uh, the correct mode for the approach. You can throw both the lights on now. Brakes pressurised, undercarriage down, mixtures not present. Mags we don't have, fuels on, sufficient imbalance, flaps deployed. Instruments green, car we don't have. Hatches and harnesses are all secure. The lights are on. Final checks are complete, we're ready to go. Altitude, we'll call Mr. Proach Altitude our circuit heights of 900 feet because we're going into the circuit. You can see the aircraft's maintaining the glide slope beautifully all the way down here. Very, very capable autopilot. Unless, of course, you're unlucky enough to have one of those um, Cap 140 equipped ones. In which case, I'm so sorry for your loss. Now, what sort of landing performance should we be getting out of the DA-42? How, uh, how does it handle on landing? Uh, pretty much how it flies, really. Let's uh, go speed below 113 landing flap. I'm not going to touch the power at all. It should come back to about 85 on its own. You can see the nose comes down with the flap. That's perfect, exactly how it should happen. Uh, maybe need to take a tight bit of power out now. So, yeah, the aircraft should be very, very benign on landing. You Generally, you avoid chopping the power completely until you're in the flare because it tends to lose a lot of slipstream lift and then bang itself down quite hard. Um, but as you can see, even a numpty like me can land pretty much spot on. Flaps up. Full power. Rotate and away we go. Positive climb, above takeoff safety speed, gears coming up. And we'll have an early turn to avoid the village. Get rid of that flight director when I can because it's a little bit distracting. And let's set climb power. Now the great thing about having such a modern, efficient wing on an aircraft like this is that it tends to work just as well at low speed as it does at high speeds. So whereas things like the Arrow will be very sloppy at uh, lower air speeds, the DA-42 is very, very well mannered even at, uh, even at sort of 100 knots, 90 knots if you're trying to slow down and, and keep yourself behind a Cessna uh, at 150 or something like that. So very very well behaved airplane and unsurprisingly they've done a great job of modeling that uh, about 35 to 40 percent power setting for 100 knots in the circuit which is working out very nicely for us here by the looks of things so looking good there we're going to do a flapless approach this time around so brakes pressurized and the carriage is coming down make sure mags don't have fuels on sufficient to balance flaps we're not going to use instruments on the green car people don't have hatches not it's all secure lights are on so as opposed to uh, 85 knots with about 78, I believe it is, over the threshold for the touchdown speed with full flap, you just want to be uh, 90 knots with 85 over the threshold when you're flapless. We're going to turn just before Cockgrave here. A little bit of nose down trim. Keeping it to 30 degrees angler bank maximum. Just starting a gentle descent. It's not the hardest thing in the world to uh, get the speed off, even with a very slippy wing like this, because the landing gear is very draggy and it's always available to you. And you've got disc mode as well when you need it, so pretty much a non-event. But I'm sure I'll find a way to cock it up in uh, the best traditions of this channel.
let the speed come back a bit now. Just using a little bit of disc mode just to wind about 10 knots of speed off. Touch high, touch fast. Let's get back onto the ideal profile. That's looking better. Take it back out of disc. So you don't want that extra drag for the touchdown. Coming back to 85. Back on the throttles. There we go. Full power. Rotates. See the stall heat fail coming up there. Right. Gear's coming up. So there's one thing left to do now, isn't there, really? And it's uh, give ourselves an engine failure. Now, normally the way we do this in, uh, in real life is just pull one of the throttles back and simulate it because it would be very silly to do this uh, for real. But because we're in flight simulator and because everybody loves uh, a good real engine failure. Let's give ourselves a critical engine failure. So, ooh, there we go. So, power up, gear up, flap up, pitch up. Dead leg, dead engine. Left leg's dead, left engine's dead. Confirm. Pulling the throttle back. No change. So then, left engine master would go off. You can see the, the prop's gone straight into feather. As soon as you flip that master switch off, um, it also feathers the propeller. Now, we need to ignore... Normally, you would um, use rudder to get the ball back into the middle. But um, in Microsoft Flight Simulator, the way that the, the balance balls work is not quite how they work in real life. So you have to kind of ignore that and just look at the horizon and make sure the aircraft's not yawing left or right, which we aren't. And you can see we're getting in the region of 500 feet per minute rec climb, which is very impressive for a, uh, a light twin like this, believe it or not. Um, normally about 100 feet per minute is about as good as it gets. But uh, the DA42 capable of a lot more than that. I'll, uh, I'll get the climb performance table up so you can check it for yourself and I can show that I'm not uh, completely selling you a duff one. I'll give myself some rudder trim. I'm going to use all of it for the climb. And we are level now, so I'm going to let the nose come down and uh, we'll get rid of the rudder trim as she speeds up. I'm going to come back to max continuous on the live engine now. And as we gain speed, we'll need less and less of that rudder trim in. And I'm just winding that off by applying rudder pressure with my feet at the moment. Which is normally my preference in real life, because twiddling around with the rudder trim constantly is a great way to distract yourself from flying the aeroplane. So normally, just stay live on the pedals. Works just as well uh, in a big aeroplane. Believe it or not, the 737 is probably easier to control on one engine than the DA42 is. It requires less effort on the pedals. This is the hardest workout that you're ever going to have, certainly as a DA42 pilot, maybe as, as any kind of uh, light aircraft pilot, because relatively powerful aircraft, um, lightweight, on one engine, especially critical engine, dead. So with both engines turning right, the left engine is what's called the critical engine. It's the one that has the biggest effect on performance uh, and yaw. So we'll try and trim this out using rudder trim. You can see the trim wheel's moving. That's my control of my joystick that I'm using to do that. And now we've got it leveled and the airplane's moderately happy, we can do some securing checks. So the securing checks are very straightforward. It's just going to be alternate on the affected side, off, and fuel through the guard and off on the affected side. So that's the securing checklist complete. And we can see with max continuous set on the live. It's that little kick over there that the engine did there. That's exactly what the real aeroplane does from time to time at a higher uh, cruise airspeed. Uh, believe it or not, we, we do actually shut down engines in flight, but at a safe altitude away from any populated areas or anything like that uh, to demonstrate it to students. We would never do it in the circuit. Um, but that's just what it does in real life. I can definitely vouch for that. So really, really nicely modelled. You can see it's just kicking over. It's not sort of free rotating as a turbine would. It's uh, feel there's sort of compression behind that. Um, now, it might be sensible in real life to extend downwind a little bit, give yourself a slightly longer approach to help with things, but, you know, I'm feeling cocky today, so let's turn in the normal place. I'm going to use drag start descending. I'm not going to touch the throttle at all for now. I'm just going to use some drag and in fact I'm going to use speed below 133 stage of flap as well 
we are sort of high and fast actually so this isn't going to work as well as it normally does but normally what I do is I'd adjust the throttle very very little and just use drag from the gear and flap to get the aircraft descending and that means that there's no changing trim or yaw required as part of this manoeuvre which is how you're supposed to fly it and not go over 30 degrees angle bank that's definitely not how you're supposed to fly it um, yeah so this is a bit ropey it's just because I've not really left myself enough space now you also need an asymmetric committal altitude we'll call it uh, 300 above ground and we're below that now so we are now committed to land and I'm gonna have to take a bit of power out because we're much too high so it kind of scruffy it's not as powered really want to do this particular maneuver in real life but a bit of scuff never harmed anyone eh? mostly near the center line halfway down the runway very very unprofessional but would you expect anything different Okay. Alright, let's uh, restart this engine for taxi because she doesn't taxi too well on one engine, just as in real life. Okay, landing lights, strobes, transponder goes to standby. Peter, he comes off. The caution. There we go. Okay, park brake is set. Now you normally have to wait uh, two minutes for the um, turbochargers to cool before you shut the engines down but uh, we've been waiting two minutes while we taxi if you keep the engines to a very very low power setting below like 10-15% as you're taxiing in you can get away without having to sit here for two minutes so we'll assume that that's uh, exactly what happened the fuel pumps can go off now uh, auxiliary pumps are off that's good so avionics master switch can go taxi light can go and then we can flip these off like that. There we go. And we'll take our uh, noise cancelling headset off. So we can hear the ambient noise. Electric master off. Get the door open. And there we go. Another review flight successfully survived. Okay, so I suppose it's time for me to come to my possibly slightly biased conclusion <laughs> about this aeroplane. Um, all disclaimers out of the way, yes, okay, I've um, had a hand in, in helping develop this, um, but I genuinely think it's one of the best light aircraft in Microsoft Flight Simulator that I've flown. Obviously a bit of sentiment as well because it's the airplane which I fly a lot in real life and I have flown a lot and it, it means a lot to me because it's been a huge part of my career. Um, but it's so cool to see it in, in the simulator and implemented so, so well. Uh, but I'll break it down to the usual categories so um, we, can, uh, we can keep things standardised. Hello to you. Um, so, positives. First positive, the quality of the modeling. Uh, I mean, pretty much every airplane in Microsoft Flight Simulator looks amazing. This is no exception. Everything works beautifully. You can just look at the detail on the on the LED uh, wingtip light there. Um, very, very nice. Obviously, everything's very, very shiny and clean, but there are little streaks of dirt here and there, which uh, indicates an aircraft which is new and well looked after, but still used which is probably my favorite really type of um, wear state shall we say in flight simulator external models it looks like a real airplane because it's got a little bit of dirt here and there which you naturally get seeping out of the the cracks here when you fly through cloud and stuff like that inevitably the inside of the cowling is dirtier than the outside and little bits of uh, little bits of that seep through there as you're flying through rain or cloud or what have you um, but I mean the DA-42 is a very very clean very smooth aircraft because it's essentially made of plastic, carbon fiber plastic, but it uh, certainly doesn't look like the, the dented uh, oil canny surface of a, of a traditional aluminium uh, piston aircraft. So 
they've really captured that look. I don't think it looks too... They were worrying that it, it, it looked a little bit too basic and not detailed enough because of how smooth the skin was and they were trying to introduce more wear and stuff to the surface to make it look um, more detailed but I think that was the wrong road to go down and they wound it back and went back to this more sort of smooth look um, because if you go and look at the vast majority of DA42s the vast majority of them look very nice and, and clean and shiny like this so um, yeah top marks for this it's it's as good as as any external model as as we've got in microsoft flight simulator i think it's very very detailed very very realistic um they've gone to a huge amount of uh, time and effort to make it look just right which i think uh, they've done so top marks for that uh interior model is yeah just as good i mean we had a look at the the tdi one in the um hangar and this is obviously the six which has a different colored panel and a few more switches but it's effectively the same thing just the textures are, are really spot on um for me you can look at these things and you can imagine it it just recalls exactly how it feels in real life just to look at this stuff um uh, so very very cool you see the f extinguisher over there uh with a sneaky little cows reference and the logo on that um Although it does say for X Plane 12, maybe this isn't, um, maybe that uh, extinguisher isn't quite uh, to up to code for Microsoft Flight Simulator. Maybe it needs to change. Um, anyway, so the uh, yeah, the the exterior and interior model absolutely brilliant, really really good. Uh, the next thing I'm going to praise is the sound model. Would you expect anything less from the guy who came up with the uh, the Fly by Way 320 sound model? Not that I've flown much of that, but I'm sure a lot of you guys have. Um, Boris has done awesome, awesome work with the sound model. And for any of you who enjoy flying the TDI version of this aircraft, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> so the sound model, really, really good. I think it really captures the quite unique sound of a DA-42. You really, you hear it coming from miles away because it's there's nothing that quite sounds like a DA-42 does. Um, except maybe a DA-62. So they, they are really distinctive sounding aeroplanes and Boris has done a, an amazing job of capturing that. And not just that, but the other little noises as well that go with it, like even things like the variable ele elevator backstop sound, um, the fuel pumps, the, the gyros spinning up when you turn the battery on, all of that stuff is, is present and correct and done to an incredibly high standard. So fantastic. Top marks for that. Um, the next one is going to be the one that always means the most to me and probably means the most to you guys as well. It's the fidelity of the flight model. So it hits all of the numbers as you'd expect. Um, I mean, a lot of... I'd say the most most uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator aircraft can hit the book figures these days. Um, you don't have these ridiculously overpowered or underpowered aeroplanes all that often. Um, maybe in the very, very sort of cheap end of the market. But this one certainly hits all the book figures, but it's not just that, it's how it flies as well. Like I showed you with the pitch and power in the steep turn exercise, it's how it stalls, and it's just how it feels to fly. It just feels nice, just the right amount of stable. It still gets banged around by thermals and things like that, just like the real aeroplane does. But it never feels like a handful, and that's just how the real aircraft feels when it's airborne. Very, very sensitive. Uh, to the controls just like the real aircraft roll rates pitch rates are all spot on you've got the pitch change um, and the drag with the flap and gear is pretty much exactly spot on where it should be um, so so much so that all of the the exercises that i demonstrate to students in real life and the the way that i fly them all work perfectly in this airplane so if you're a student going forward onto multi-engine trainings cpl ir multi-engine piston ratings what ha whatever um, this is a really good tool to help you practice for that. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably the real selling point of this aeroplane. It's very, very, very well done. The next thing I'm going to say is a huge positive is the price. It's about 24 great British pounds, about $30 US, um, available from the Orbex store as we speak. I think that that's, for, for this type of a modeling the, the amount of care and fidelity that's gone into this it's it's around the same sort of price point as the Caronado aircraft which are good don't get me wrong but they are not quite this sort of level so i think you're getting a really really good deal with this aircraft in my humble opinion um obviously i haven't paid for my copy it was very nicely gifted to me but i think certainly if, if i had nothing to do with this airplane i would be going out and buying it right now because it's great value 
Um, obviously, to me, it means a lot to have this aeroplane in Microsoft Flight Simulator. But to a, a lot of you guys, it's going to mean a lot as well because there, there's so many pilots out there who've trained on one of these aeroplanes or flown them at some point and you'll want to get your hands on it or get your hands on it to prepare for going out and training one of these in real life. And I think this is a great opportunity to do that at a really reasonable price. So that's all the positives. Now, negatives. Now, very, 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 very small number of negatives. Um, but really the main one is going to be centered on this thing. Not on the real G1000, but on the working title G1000. Now, it's completely understandable why cows have gone and used the working title G1000, because it's saved them a huge amount of effort in trying to code their own one or something like that. Um, it would be ridiculous to expect them to, to do the, all of that systems modeling and keep the price anywhere near where it is at the moment. They'd have to probably double the price if they went and custom modeled all of that stuff. Um, plus, we'd probably be talking about a release date in like 2026 or something. So more it's more along the lines of working title, um, hurry up and sort it out. Um, I know they are working on it. They're improving it bit by bit constantly. Um, but there are some features which, to me, um, as an instructor on the real aeroplane, kind of annoy me. In fact, just as a, as a little example, uh, obviously there were those things missing that uh, I was talking about, things like the um, auxiliary pages um, and stuff like that. But also, in the, uh, the flight plan page here, um, there should be an option to um, go to the main, the big screen map, um, sorry, to go to the big screen uh, full page, flight plan page, and, and not have the map on here, and just have it sort of full flight plan, um, with all the data from the flight plan in there, which is very, very useful when you're on a flight, because it allows you to have things like cumulative distances if you want them, it allows you to have um, altitudes at each waypoint, although you do, you can get those on here. Um, but uh, the, the fuel planning aspect is incredibly important, um, especially for students when you're going off and you're, you're planning your, your flights for your CPL or your IR. The examiner expects you to, to manage the fuel level, fuel states of the aircraft and keep a plug. And each waypoint you get to, you're updating your plug with actual fuel data versus the planned fuel data and you're looking at the difference between the two to make critical decisions in flight. Shut up aeroplane, I'm making a point here. You can't do that on the working title at the moment. I think that's a huge shortcoming. It's really annoying not to be able to check your fuel planning as you're flying along. Now, obviously, in Flight Simulator, you can always just bring up the fuel menu and give yourself another few gallons of fuel. But in real life, obviously, you can't do that. And if you want to, to go for max realism, then you need to be able to do the fuel planning just as you would in the real aeroplane. Uh, and you just can't do that with what we've got here. Um, so that would be really my my only bugbear. Um, the other thing being the, the click spot on the key. Just like a big click spot, please. Um, but other than that, I think this is a really, really good airplane. Yeah, okay, they could add some ground handling stuff and blah, blah, blah. But again, you know, it's going to drag out the development period and, and having had a little bit of an insider insight into all of that stuff. It really does take a huge amount of effort and time to code all of those things in. And Cows is a very small team. Um, it's essentially just sort of three, four guys. They're all quite young, by the way, as well. So it's very impressive what they've managed to achieve here. But anyway, I'm digressing again. Those are really the only very, very nitpicky things that I could come out with. The biggest downside of the aircraft is, is just needs a little bit more features on the on the working title G1000 so this is more of a message to working title than than anyone um, hurry up and, and add stuff to this uh, certainly going forward into flight sim 24 I expect this thing to to be a little bit sharper a little bit more like the real thing and they are you know working on it as we go but they're also working on a bunch of other stuff as well I'd, I'd rather they work on this thing personally but anyway that's it really that's uh, all I've got to say so Please leave in the comments what you think, if you agree with me, or if you think I am talking out of my rear passage. And if you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Press the bell thing, do all that other stuff. Um, and hopefully I uh, I'll, shall see you in the next one. We may have some more live streams and all sorts of other exciting things coming as we go forward through 2024. So take care. See you next time.